Greetings and welcome to Unit 12, the Criminal Justice System in Texas. In this lecture, we will distinguish between misdemeanors and felonies, discuss the death penalty in Texas, and briefly examine some arguments for and against the death penalty. We have a whole lot of ground to cover, so without further delay, let's dive right into this. Okay, so there are two types of crimes in Texas. Uh, first off, we have misdemeanors. These are considered minor crimes. For example, uh, getting a speeding ticket. And then we have felonies. Felonies are defined as major crimes. An example would be murder. So, within both, within both types of crime, right, misdemeanors and felonies, we see a tier system of offenses. So let's take a look at these differing tiers. So with misdemeanors, let's start off with Class C. Class C misdemeanors include theft of property worth less than $20. A person under the age of 21 purchases, attempts to purchase, or in the possession of alcohol. And of course, I already mentioned you know, speeding tickets. Uh, punishment, maximum fine of $500. And the court of original jurisdiction, that is to say the court that has the right to uh, first hear the case, is the justice of the peace or a municipal court. Now, the uh, justice of the peace is commonly also referred to as the JP, right? Uh, but what we see here, right, is some overlapping jurisdiction with the Justice of the Peace and a Municipal Court. That's interesting to note with Class C misdemeanors. Uh, let's move on to Class B misdemeanors, which include making terroristic threats, uh, threat, uh, theft rather, of property worth $20 to $500. Uh, the punishment, maximum of 180 days in jail, and or a maximum fine of $2,000. Notice here that the court of original jurisdiction is the county court. Let's move on to class A misdemeanors, which include uh, resisting arrest, uh, theft of property valued between $500 and $1,500. The punishment maximum of one year in jail, and or a maximum fine of $4,000. Again, the court of original jurisdiction is the county court. Now, I hope we've seen, right, some increasing uh, the seriousness of the crime, and, and along with that, we see an increase in punishment for these types of misdemeanors. Now, let's dive into felonies. Because we're going to kind of see a seminal pattern here. So, a third degree felony, okay, uh, this includes impersonating someone online, uh, the theft of property uh, worth between uh, $20,000 to $100,000, the punishment two to 10 years in prison, and a possible maximum fine of $10,000. Uh, note the court of original jurisdiction is the district court. Now we move on to second degree felonies, uh, which include manslaughter and the theft of property worth between a hundred thousand to two to <laughs> to two hundred thousand dollars, and the punishment uh, two to twenty years in prison. It ranges and a possible maximum fine of $10,000. Again, the court of original jurisdiction is the district court. Okay, so let's talk now about first degree felonies, uh, which include murder, uh, the theft of property worth over uh, $200,000. Uh, we see a punishment that ranges between five to 99 years in prison and a possible maximum fine of $10,000. Again, the court of original jurisdiction is district court. 
So let's talk about Moro. Right? Uh, just just a a brief encapsulation of what Moro is, because the state penal code does go in depth and define uh, what is what constitutes Moro. But this is a good summary of that. Okay, uh, the Moro of a law uh, law enforcement official, uh, prison guard, a firefighter, uh, which. Uh, firefighter on duty or a police officer, a law enforcement officer on duty, uh, commits murder with other types of felonies. In other words, uh, some an individual com uh, actually murders someone while they were trying to commit other felonies. Right? Uh, murder for hire, that is to say that uh, while an individual may not have actually pulled the trigger or actually killed an individual, they hired someone to do that for them. Right? It's called enumeration, uh, murder for enumeration, as that is to hire someone to kill someone else. Uh, you are liable uh, for that murder, even though they did not, even though that individual did not actually pull the trigger or actually did the killing, because they hired someone to do that for them, they can still be held legally accountable, responsible for that murder. That makes sense. And then, of course, the murder of someone under the age of 10. Right? Again, the Texas Penal Code uh, defines what constitutes murder and is a kind of an extensive list. But this is a good summary uh, of that penal code. Okay, so to talk about rather, to talk about the punishment, right? Because that's, that's ultimately what the discussion about the death penalty is, right? Is it a form of punishment that we should use. Right? And of course, we will have differing opinions about this, and I'm glad we do. Right? Um, we will have a different answer to that question. Right? Uh, but before we get into the for and against arguments for the death penalty, let's do a quick review about the death penalty. And to do that, we have to go back to 1972. Uh, we have to talk about the Furman v. Georgia Supreme Court case. Uh, so, and it, it will make sense why we need to do this here in just a moment. Okay, so Furman uh, burglarized a home when a family member discovered him. So that, that is to say that Furman broke into a house um, and in, in the process of doing that, he was discovered by someone who was, who was there in the household. Okay. Uh, Foreman attempted to flee the scene, and in doing so, he tripped and fell. When he did that, um, the, a gun that he had on him went off. While he fell, the gun that he was carrying went off and killed a resident of that home. Now, let me ask you a question. Okay, let, let me ask you a question. Do you think Furman, in this case, right, he, he had full intention of breaking into a home, he broke into that home to steal, right? And, but as he was being discovered, he was trying to run, he was trying to flee. In the process of doing that, he fell. When he fell, he his gun went off and it struck and killed someone. Let me ask you this question. Do you think he deserved the death penalty? Because I really am curious about your thoughts on this. Do you think that that individual deserves the death penalty? Because Georgia said yes. And this, uh, Foreman did, in fact... Uh, appealed his case and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court heard this case, along with three other cases, by the way, that dealt with um, that dealt with the death penalty. Okay, so, um, but with that said, though, in Furman v. Georgia, the question before the U.S. Supreme Court was very similar to the question I asked you. Right? Does the imposition and carrying out the death penalty in such cases constitute cruel? an unusual punishment, therefore a violation of the 8th and 14th Amendment. Again, remember, the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, 
grants us protection from cruel and unusual punishment. So the question before the court ultimately was, does the death penalty, carrying it out, does it cross the line of cruel and unusual punishment? Now, you and I, and you and I in the court, may disagree on that on this question, is it cool and unusual? But in 1972, the Supreme Court said, yes, in a 5-4 decision, the majority said, the Supreme Court ruled that yes, the death penalty, the action, the process of the death penalty in these types of cases, that is to say cases that dealt with rape and moral, that is to say that uh, an individual was sentenced to death for rape and or murder, okay? Uh, that these types of cases, yes, it constitutes cruel and unusual punishment, thus a violation of the U.S. Constitution. So, in 1972, the death penalty was banned nationwide, including Texas. It was banned. Now, to give you some perspective, I suppose, um, this was within my parents' lifetime. Okay. So it wasn't that long ago, right? So anytime, um, you know, when we talk about the courts, when we talk about does you know the U.S. Supreme Court does it have an impact on society? Look no further. I mean, there's there's other cases we can look at, right? Uh, Roe v. Wade, um, Brown v. Board of Education. Um, you know, I I am. There are so many cases that absolutely impact society. That impact society. Absolutely, there's so many more. Uh, Buck v. Bell is another example. Uh, but, but, oh, oh yeah, uh, Plessy v. Ferguson, which Brown v. Board of Education uh, overturned. The point I'm trying to get at is, um, though, yes, Supreme Court absolutely has an impact on society. And look no further than uh, this 1972 decision. So, the, the act, the practice of executing an inmate was outlawed in the United States. But this wasn't lived very long. Okay? Uh, the death penalty was reinstated uh, January 1st, 1974. So, there was a two-year ban on it, if you will. Uh, Texas, we reinstated it, again, in, two years later, in 1974. Here in Texas, uh, the execution chamber, uh, that is to say this is where we take inmates uh, to execute, uh, is the Walls Unit, uh, which is located in Huntsville, Texas, and it's been there since 1923. Now, Huntsville, Texas is only about like, what, an hour, maybe an hour and a half north of Houston. Uh, so let's talk about the methods of execution that Texas has used throughout our history. Okay, from nineteen eighteen, sorry, from eighteen nineteen uh, to nineteen twenty three, uh, our meth our, our method that we used was hanging. Uh, from nineteen twenty three to nineteen sixty four, uh, we used electrocution. And then from 1976 into current, into, to date, to current date, uh, we used lethal injection. Now, uh, we were, Texas, we were the first state to use lethal injection as a method of execution uh, when we executed Charles Brooks on December 7th, 1982. And a number of executions were carried out in the United States using this method uh, since 1976. Okay. So, let's dive now into some arguments for and against the death penalty. Uh, because we have opinions on this particular issue. <laughs> and, and I don't mean to laugh to make light of the situation. Uh, but, what I mean, what, but what I'm trying to get at is there are... Uh, host of arguments for and against this, and it is almost impossible to cover every one of them. But we can cover a broad range of these arguments. So let's take a dive. Right. So one argument for 
the death penalty is a deterrent to other crimes, right? It, it will act as a deterrent. If you know, right, the idea is this. For, for, for example, okay, for one example, bear with me on this very strange hypothetical. Right? The, the argument is that if you knew speeding would guarantee you the death penalty, would you speed? So the idea is, well, I, th I imagine what you would say, though, is, n no, I wouldn't speed. I mean, if it was guaranteed that you will get caught, you will. Now, there is no hiding it. There is no, you know, being careful. You will get caught. Would you speed? I think most of us would say, no. I mean, it's ludicrous, right? The, the idea of getting the death penalty for speeding. It's ludicrous. But bear with me on this hypothetical. Right? Uh, the idea is that it would deter you from that crime. Therefore, the death penalty acts as a deterrent to serious crimes, like murder. Then there's an argument on the other side about it doesn't, it, it's not a successful deterrent. We've had the death penalty since 1974, and has murder rates changed? Has serious crimes changed in the great state of Texas? So there is an argument for uh, what acts as a deterrent. Because if, 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 if that wasn't there, if, if, if there wasn't the death penalty for murder, we would see murder more. Right? Then there's the other side which says this doesn't act as a deterrent whatsoever. It doesn't change. There is no difference here. Right? That's one argument. Another argument, uh, again, for and against the death penalty. Some argue um, that um, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That is to say that if you killed, that is to say if an individual kills, like my family member, then I deserve the right, I have the right for an eye for an eye to take the life of the person who murdered my family member. Right? So, there is a religious argument for it. And then there's the religious argument <laughs> against it. Right? Turn the other cheek. Right? Um, so, there could be a religious argument for both sides on this case. Uh, to, to carry out the death penalty and to... And to against the idea of carrying out the death penalty. There's a moral argument. Should we take the life of another? A again, um, this will come, this, this, this question of morality will come back again, especially when we get to the fourth point here about justice for victims. Um, but bear with me. Uh, there is an argument for, a, there is a moral argument for it. That is to say that. Should society, should we put up with individuals who have no respect for life? Who, if we know they're going to get out again, I mean, uh, for which we know, if they get out, if they ever see the light of day, they will kill again. Or, if they're in prison, they will kill while they're in prison. They have no respect for life. None. There is a moral question of, is it better to execute that individual who has no respect for life? And then there's the other side that says there is a moral obligation to not, for the state not to put to death that individual, even though they have no respect for life. And of course, a host of other beliefs can come into this debate. Again, for and against the death penalty that aren't religious or deal with uh, morality. Right. Justice for victims uh, is one argument, right? That we have to have the death penalty to ensure that there are justice for the victims of that individual, right? But the other side argues that death penalty fails at that promise. That carrying out the death penalty uh, doesn't actually, that, that's not justice. Some would argue it's revenge. Right? 
But... Yeah. This, this particular topic, it, it's heavy. And there is so much complexity to it because it does involve our understanding of life. It, it invokes our... Because it has to. It invokes our understanding of justice. What is just? Right? One side uh, that argues for the death penalty would argue that we are free agents. And as we are free agents, we determine our fate. And if we know the consequence for certain crimes is death, you have the free choice to make that decision. You as an individual make that choice. The state doesn't do it for you. The people, we the people, we don't make that choice for you. That's your choice that you make. You know the consequence. And you decide as a free agent to engage in that, to do that, to, to, to execute that, pun not intended. Then there's the other side that would argue, well, this is, well, the death penalty is actually a violation of international human rights. That there are treaties um, that we've signed that would actually state that we shouldn't have the death penalty because it's a violation of human rights. So, I have to ask you, okay? I have to ask you, what should we do? Which argument do you buy into? And just to be clear about this particular issue, there's no real, in my mind, there's no absolute, well, I shouldn't use that word. There's no right or wrong answer to this question. Do you believe in the death penalty? Because the argument for is a strong one. At the same time, the argument against the death penalty is another strong one. So I'm really am curious to know what your thoughts on this. Because, well, yeah, I'm just curious. I'm, I'm curious. So another argument against the death penalty is the cost of the death penalty. That it costs way more money to actually execute an individual rather than to, you know, put them in prison for life. So what I would like to do now is dive into the cost of the death penalty. Okay. So let's let's dive into this. Let, let's jump into this. So the average cost per sentence, right? Lifetime incarceration, that is 40 years in prison, right? It costs us, the taxpayers, uh, $750,000. Capital punishment, that is to say uh, the death penalty, is $2.3 million. So you might be asking, wow, that is such a huge jump. Why? Uh, and that is an excellent question. Let's dive into why does it cost more to execute criminals, right? Th those who those who cross that threshold of cap who th who cross that threshold into capital punishment. Let's take a look at this. Okay, so attorney time and pay, right? In a 2010 uh, judicial conference report, they found that defense attorneys spent an average of 1,888 hours per trial between 1989 and 1997 on death penalty cases. Between 1998 and 2004, the average increased to 3,557 hours. By 2007, according to the American Bar Association, many counties, yes, I said about counties, i.e. tax dollars, uh, were paying at least $100 per hour to these attorneys. Now, just carry over the decimal just a little bit here, and we realize very quickly that one that the cost that 2.3 million part of that cost is here is is attorney fees. Um, experts, 
uh, as the quantity and cost of exports increase, um, prosecution and defense teams are spending more to compete with one another. I mean, after all, we have to remember, right, that the court system is kind of an adversarial system. And what I mean to say that is, you know, the defense and the prosecution, they have different goals in mind, right? They have, it's adversarial in the context of the defendant is defending the prosecution, right? Two different goals. One is to uh, show beyond reasonable doubt that this individual, in fact, committed this crime. And the defense is there to say, no, there is doubt to say that this person actually did this crime. And here's the evidence for that. Right? So it's adversarial in that context. So, of course, they're competing with one another. Right? They're trying to get the best experts because, as District Attorney Randall Sims of Porter County, Texas said, and I quote, I won't use anybody to do autopsies except for triple board certified forensic pathologist so that I don't wind up having one only certified in one area and then the defense has a better one, right? Again, this adversarial, um, again, prosecution has their, has their goals and the uh, def defense has their separate goals that, which are completely different, <laughs> right? So, yeah. Yeah, so the cost of exports, the, the cost of getting people to testify to, to work on these cases, it's, it's increased. The unpredictability of a death penalty uh, case being heard by a, a trial jury. Right? So just the unpredictability, unpredictability of it, rather. Uh, so when an appeals court reverses a death penalty case, this could be caught, they could overturn a death penalty case for a host of reasons. Right? A fault in the work of the defense attorney or the prosecutor. Right? An incorrect instruction was given to a jury by the judge, because that can happen. A, a piece of evidence that should have been shown to the jury but wasn't, or a piece of evidence, or, or, yeah, <laughs> or a number of other reasons. Maybe, like, like I was just going to say, maybe there was a piece of evidence that, sh um, that shouldn't have been shown for a host of, a, for a host of reasons. Yeah, it was, right? Maybe that evidence was obtained illegally, or whatever the case may be, okay? There are a host of things that could go wrong that could warrant a appellate court to overturn the original decision by that district court. Okay. Um, so the county faces the cost of an entire second trial and another round of appeals. So this, the, the unpredictability of it, um, it, this can be a source of cost that, 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 that is a part of that 2.3 million that I spoke about just a moment ago. Okay. Uh, mitigation, right? Investigating past circumstances. Now, mitigating circumstances do exist, right? Um, the, an explanation for the why this person behaves this way can be explained by the past by the life they've had, right? The household they grew up in. Um, for example, um, for me, I'm a news junkie, right? I mentioned that. I, I am a complete news junkie. I love watching the news. Well, that's kind of a product of my upbringing, right? Um, we can look at we can look at past life circumstances to help us explain why we do what we do today. This can also be applied to criminals, right? So, investigating past circumstances to help us understand why a person did what they did, right? A uh, North Carolina office of the Capital Defense uh, of, the, of Capital Defender they pay mitigation specialists between thirty-five dollars to fifty-five dollars per hour. Interesting though, here in Harris County, we pay seventy-five dollars. Per hour. So looking at, I give you another example. Right? 
uh, mitigating circumstances. Looking at someone's past life, right, um, to try to understand what they've done, right. Uh, so was someone bullied in the past, and that's the reason why they bullied now, right. So you, you see where I'm going with this. Is that to say uh, that there's, that type of behavior is excused? By no means. But the idea that that person was set on that course because of these mitigating circumstances can have an impact. Okay. Juries. Yes, juries. In a 2011 study that was done by the Ninth Circuit Court Judge um, Ann and Tony, they found that Jury selection could take as much as a month longer in death penalty trials and cost roughly $200,000 more than any other murder trials. Let me say it again. Death penalty cases cost roughly $200,000 more than other murder cases. Okay? Uh, the attorney, they asserted that as support for the death penalty declines, it takes longer, more paid hours on the part of attorneys, the judge, and court staff to find 12 jurors who are willing to impose the death penalty. So it's costly. And lastly, the last reason here, housing. Uh, the death row inmates are housed in administrative segregation. That is to say, in isolated, you know, um, they're in isolation, right? Or commonly referred to as uh, sol uh, solidarity confinement, which costs more per day due to heightened security. Uh, when someone's in um, solidarity confinement, this requires high security, which means more uh, different guards, different types of infrastructure, which costs more to make and costs more to maintain. In a 2014 study done by uh, of Kansas, they reported that death row prisoners cost about 49380 to house per, per year, whereas a general population prisoner costs ha uh, less than half that. Um, $24,690. Right? So the yearly cost of housing and medical, and medical care uh, for California's death row inmates, that's actually $184 million. So all this goes into that price of how much it costs to carry out the death penalty. Now, of course, California's uh, medical care is different than what we have here in Texas, right? So we see differing states with differing, uh, with, with, with differing, um, how much, differing cost, right, is what I'm trying to get at, <laughs> right? So that said, all these, all these six reasons that we've quickly taken a look at, this can help explain why the death penalty is so expensive. So with that discussed, well, let me ask you again, you know, the death penalty, do you agree with it? This is not to say one way or the other which way we should, you know, uh, by no means I'm not trying to guide which way we should. But this is an exposure to some of the arguments that we have seen for and against the death penalty. And I'm really am curious where you stand on this issue. Should a society have the death penalty? That is a question, as voters, you and I uh, will have to answer, right? That is a question that we should have an open discussion about between elected officials, candidates, our next-door neighbors, and our family and friends. But with that said, if this concludes this lecture, if... If I've said anything um, that's confusing or, um, you know, that, that you want some more input on, by all means, please feel free to reach out to me. But until next time, peace.